gives me great joy to be here tonight and to participate in this study. I have profited by being here this week. And I really doubt that I'm the one who should be speaking on this topic. And in preparation, I hold out a number of books about preaching. One of the books I selected, Principles and Practice of Preaching by one Ilian T. Jones, began in the preface by quoting another man who said, quote, beware of the person who announces a course on how to preach by one who knows. He said that such a person deserves to be called an imposter. And then added, quote, no man knows how to preach. You will have to reckon with this significant discouraging fact that the greatest preachers who have ever lived have confessed themselves poor bunglers to the end, groping after an ideal which eluded them forever. He adds, however, that one person may pass on to others what from observation and experience he knows should be done in order to preach well. Well, because of my reservations on teaching on this topic, I conceived a plan that proved to be helpful to me. I thought, why not ask some of our foremost and most effective preachers some questions about how their own experiences in becoming preachers? And our brethren were very cooperative and helpful, and we get to get a glimpse into their thinking on this topic. <clears throat> I sent the survey to 22 preachers, and 20 of our brethren responded. I think some were out of the country. <clears throat> and I asked them to number, in order of importance, these five different things that have helped men to become gospel preachers. They were association or travel with an experienced preacher, higher education, personal Bible study, dedication and perseverance, home congregation, and then a somewhat nebulous category of other. I also asked, what do you know now that you wish you had known before you began? Another question, what kind of training did you not get or did you not have that would have helped you? Finally, I asked any suggestions or comments about how to help those who aspire to preach. Well, from my own perspective, I think it's possibly presumptuous and maybe even overbold of me to think I could tell someone how to preach. But I can share some things from my own experience. There are two convictions that stand out. Number one, never stop learning. Number two, Practice makes perfect, so preaching should take place continuously if you expect to preach. Now, I know that among the denominations and the digressives, there are schools, colleges, seminaries, preacher training schools. And when I first began to preach, I was told by at least uh, two young men who aspired to preach that, so they, that someone said they said, uh, I want to be a preacher but I want to be a cornfield preacher like Johnny Elmore. One of them had aspirations to go to Abilene Christian College, and the other had similar aspirations. But as you may surmise, no one ever, neither one ever became a gospel preacher. I had another experience that impressed me about the ineffectiveness of preacher training schools. I met a personable digressive preacher in Ardmore, Oklahoma, who uh, happened to be at one of the local churches, who was a graduate of preacher training school. And uh, once in conversation, I happened to mention a preacher who started out in the 1940s traveling with one of our older respected preachers. This man never amounted to much among us and wound up preaching for the digressives. And when I mentioned this man's name, this preacher said, well, I know him. He taught me everything I know. Of course, they do say if you can't do it, teach it, don't they? Well, uh, I want to notice first the category of higher education. This was one of the categories in my survey. And in my survey, 20 of some of our most effective preachers, not all of them by any means, higher education came in dead last. 
and this is among some of our preachers who have degrees from universities. I think that is not to say that a good education is not important or to be avoided. In fact, in our time, we can reasonably expect to preach before people who have university degrees or maybe a good education. However, some who speak in the vernacular of the people have had success in spite of a lack of higher education. And recently I held a meeting at uh, Houston, Missouri. And while there, Brother Irvin Baker mentioned a book written by a preacher, the great-grandfather of one of the members. And this member, Brother Kyle Silliman, loaned me that book to read. My curiosity was aroused uh, because Irvin said that they should have had someone to proof that book because it was filled with grammatical mistakes. Well, I noticed something that Irvin missed. The book entitled The Mountain Preacher was mostly about preaching in Kentucky over around uh, where Blue Springs and our present day Walnut Grove congregations are. And in the front of the book, it is stated that it was written in the language of the people. Now, you know what that means? That means the preacher used such terms as I seen, I knowed, I heard, and a lot of others. However, Brother Thaddeus Hudson referred to him as the second raccoon of Kentucky because he sometimes had a hundred or more uh, responses or additions during a meeting and often left a congregation behind where no one, where not one existed before. So I remember reading that Alexander Campbell said that raccoon John Smith, who baptized an average of a thousand people a year in Kentucky, 150 years ago, said that a college education would have ruined raccoon John Smith. So education is good. I certainly am not knocking education or minimizing its importance, but it's no substitute for earnestness and dedication. One of the preachers responded, your advice to enroll in public speaking courses at the university was of great value. Another one wrote, I thought that perhaps a college education might have helped, but I have mixed feelings about it. I could have gotten a scholarship to any college in my state, but I thought at the time that it would not aid my preaching. I can see now that a college education helps young people to learn discipline and study, and I recommend to young preachers that they go ahead and get a degree, something they can fall back on if their preaching career is not successful. However, I wonder if I would have been as dedicated to my dream to be a preacher if I had gone to college and been subjected to the influences there. I see it as both positive and negative. This is another preacher's advice. Get a college degree. Learn to work with your hands. Very good advice. And uh, spend a lot of time with older brethren. But then what about the home congregation? Frankly, I was somewhat disappointed that the impact of the congregation was so low on the scale of importance. According to my survey, it came in last, and that's regrettable. I think our congregation should be encouraging young men of ability to preach. You've heard, perhaps, that you can't hatch chickens in a refrigerator. And the same idea, I think, is present when it comes to preaching. A congregation should be a veritable incubator for gospel preachers. It ought to be a hothouse, so to speak. A congregation should be doing more than keeping house for the Lord. Because the Lord doesn't need any more housekeepers, but he does need gospel preachers. We could use 50 dedicated gospel preachers right now out in the field working for the Lord. Now the apostle said, how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10 and verse 14. Congregations should be providing opportunities for young men to become preachers by involving them in the work of the church, by studying with them, by training them to speak and to sing, and supporting them in efforts to preach and reach the lost. One of the greatest experiences of my life was in 1958, when a great number of preachers were invited to the original preacher study at Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, 
We still have those studies, of course, and they are helpful, but they do not have the depth and the intensity of that first study. We studied day and night for two weeks with teachers who were well qualified to teach us. Remember, I've been trying to preach for several years, but this was my introduction to hermeneutics. And it was like a light that came on under the tutelage of Brother Irvin Waters. We also studied homiletics and biblical prophecy and other topics. And a study of that kind would be most useful to young men who have a desire to preach. Personally, I will never forget that experience, that two weeks. Another preacher commented, I participated in the first preacher study in Wichita Falls, Texas. What I learned in that two weeks marathon of Bible study still lingers in my mind. What about association and travel with experienced gospel preachers? This was high, this was high on the list of the survey. Several mentioned that association, study, and oversight of older gospel preachers is important, in fact, vital. An older preacher pointed out that Timothy traveled with Paul and that Titus and Timothy were Paul's sons in the faith. And just here I would like to say that gospel preachers have always been my heroes. I remember lying on a pallet and uh, under a brush arbor listening to men like Homer King and Homer Gay and James R. Stewart and H.E. Robertson preach the gospel. Later on, I heard Irvin Waters and Fred Kerbo and Linwood Smith, and I thought it was an honor to have them in our home and to listen to the wonderful stories of gospel preaching. They made it so plain and so reasonable that when I began preaching, I thought all it would take to bring people into the fold all over the country was simply to tell what seems so clear and logical to me. Well, that's the way it was with Timothy. Paul was Timothy's hero in the gospel. With the example of his mother's and his grandmother's faith in Christ before him, it is no wonder that he was well attested by all the brethren who knew him. And you know, it was not only where he lived in Derby and Lystra, but also in the farther off city of Iconium, uh, and where it is likely that he was already known as a public speaker. And it was on a previous visit uh, to uh, Lystra that Paul was stoned and presumed dead, and that the disciples stood round about him, according to Acts 14 and 20. No doubt Timothy was in that group and must have been immersed previous to the stoning of the Apostle Paul because he left right, Paul left right after that. No doubt Timothy was there and witnessed, uh, according to 2 Timothy 3, 10, and 11. No doubt he wept over him, followed him, and as if raised from the dead, back into the city and saw him depart with heroic determination to another field of conflict in the preaching of the gospel. His devotion inspired Paul to say, I have no man like-minded, Philippians 2 and 20. So Paul chose Timothy to be his companion and his fellow laborer in the gospel. And just here, let me say it is my conviction that I believe a young man who aspires to be a preacher should be such as to be well port reported of by the brethren. I think some men, young men, have a, a distorted view of preaching the gospel, what it's all about. Uh, some think it as an adventure, a good way to have a good time without having to work. I ask one question on my survey that is quite revealing. That is, what do you know now that you wish you had known before you began? One brother who has been a missionary in some very hard places wrote just how difficult the vocation of preaching really is. Another said how hard it is to get Bible studies with non-Christians. Another said how to address problems that exist in most churches. Listen, preaching is a vocation, just as the preacher said, not a vacation. Preaching is hard work, and the problems that you encounter will keep you awake at night. The Apostle Paul was careful about the men he selected to go with him. 
he declined, you remember, on one occasion to take John Mark with him because he went with us not to the work, according to Acts 15 and 38. Later, evidently, when Mark had proved himself, he wrote Timothy to bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. That's in 2 Timothy 4.11. So, friends, it seems to me here we have a divine system of training preachers for older gospel preachers, experienced gospel preachers, to take them who aspire to preach and bring them along in the gospel. Every gospel preacher should follow this divine example and do his best to encourage qualified young men and train them to be gospel preachers. As many of you know, uh, Brother Linwood Smith encouraged young, many young men to preach, and I was one of those. According to one who traveled with him, his method of training was pretty simple. He said, you know, when you travel with Linwood, you don't learn anything. He just makes you want to preach so bad that you do it yourself, unquote. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration because you do learn by association and by observation. And there's an old story about an older preacher and a younger preacher going to a new town to preach. And after walking through the town for a while, the young preacher asked when they were going to preach. And the older one said, well, we've been preaching for a while. And I think that's true because, listen, people size you up when they perceive you to be a gospel preacher. They're perceptive about the way you conduct yourself. They draw conclusions based on the way you comport yourself from day to day. One of my respondents mentioned that he had lots of questions of older gospel preachers and received very little help, and that's disappointing. This is where experienced preachers should give attention. Notice some of the questions. I'm going to pass them along to you. What time should I get up in the morning? You know, when a young preacher lies in bed till 11 or 12, around noon, when all the other world has been up around 6.30 going to work, it's not a very pretty picture. What, what should I do when I first get up? How much time should I be studying? What should I be studying? How do I conduct a home study, study with an unbeliever? How do I conduct a home study with a member? How should I conduct myself when staying in someone's house while holding a meeting? That's an important study right there. Many young men have discredited themselves by the way they acted when they were staying in someone else's home. And I think you will agree that these are all topics that young preachers should be taught in their association with older preachers. Several preachers commented on the need for young preachers to be taught how to respect the homes that are entered. I could tell you some horror, horror stories about that, and I'm sure that some of the other could too. But now then, there's another category, and that is dedication and perseverance. This particular category was high on my list of things in the training and education of preachers. One of our older gospel preachers, who is very respected and revered, said, Make up your mind to preach the rest of your life with a love for the Lord and a desire to save souls. No sacrifice is too great. Sacrifice for the cause of Christ. Learn to take criticism and correction. It's been said that many young men set out to set the world on fire and have to return for more matches. You know, in the gospel field, many have fallen by the wayside. It's not a life of ease. It's not a get-rich scheme. It calls for dedication and perseverance. And some have become discouraged by a lack of response to their preaching of the gospel. I remember mentioning to Brother Linwood Smith one time that it had been some time since I'd had a baptism. And I said, I wonder if it's even, uh, if I'm doing any good at all. And his reply was in the words of the Apostle Paul. He said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1 and 17. Another of our older preachers told me one time, he said, the only ones you can hope to convert are those with a good, honest heart. And I find that to be true. And listen, when you find that good, honest heart, you don't have to quote 10,000 scriptures. 
You don't have to spend years and uh, years in trying to convert that person. All you have to do is to show them the plan of salvation when you find that good and honest heart. And that's what we're doing when we're going out to preach. Well, because of dedication and perseverance, some young men have made preachers in spite of predictions that they never would. Others have found a niche in personal work, although they were not strong pulpit speakers. One of our preachers wrote, I was fortunate to be motivated by the commitment of Linwood Smith, who taught us to preach regardless of whether they paid us or not. Another gospel preacher wrote about what helped him. He said, travel with older preachers and attending gospel meetings, hearing plain gospel pre proclaimed by dedicated men regardless of support or lack of support. Surely the Apostle Paul is an example of dedication, perseverance, because it is only commitment to a great cause that would cause someone to rise up after being stoned until he thought he was dead and go back into the city. His word to Timothy, therefore, did not sound hollow in 1 Timothy 4 and 12 when he said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now we come to the last point of my, uh, actually my survey tonight, and that is personal Bible study. This was actually number one on my survey. And one of our older preachers wrote, so important, we cannot preach what we do not know. Seek advice from those who have been there. He also commented, never assume that as a young preacher, you have discovered some new truth that no one ever knew. You haven't. This advice certainly agrees with what the Apostle taught in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 14. He said, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. The American Standard Version renders verse 15, Give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. The thought is to present the truth clearly, truthfully, without blunders, and with an exactness that cannot be gainsaid. One of our younger evangelists said, don't waste time in high school with multiple sports. Spend time doing book reports for seasoned preachers and chapter studies. An older preacher advised, looking back, I wish I had realized more the importance of preaching expository lessons rather than topical lessons. The study that goes into expository preaching is more valuable in the long run than topical studies. He then referred to Nehemiah 8 and 8, which says, So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Acts 8 and 35 also he quoted, where it says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. It is important to preach expository lessons. And the importance of a structured chronic, chronological study or a survey of the Bible was mentioned. Also mentioned was a systematic study of the book of Acts. Several mentioned such things as how to interact with others, how to arrange and conduct Bible studies, how to address problems in the church, 
how to prepare sermons. These are all valid studies. And the, the list could probably be used profitably in our preacher studies. I remember that in some of our door knocking campaigns, 1984 and uh, 85, I led several door knocking campaigns and held gospel meetings. And we practiced going to the door, knocking good and loud, and what we would say when the door opened. You may think that's so uh, primary that it doesn't even need to be mentioned. But you know, if you go up and knock hoping nobody's going to come to the door, that's probably not going to do any good. So we have to be bold in our preaching and in our exposition of the gospel. Some practical study in these things would undoubtedly pay dividends in preacher training. Some advise studying church history and access to the works of the giants who went before us. Another advised young preachers to read, 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 especially read the biographies of great preachers. Of course, the Bible should be our main area of study. Paul's advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13 was, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Listen, young preachers, commit passages of Scripture to memory. Don't bore the audience by searching for Scriptures after you get up to speak. That's boring. Do as the Apostle Peter exhorts in 1 Peter 3.15. He said, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of this in, with you, in you with meekness and fear. Yes, sir. Have the scripture memorized. Have it on the tip of your tongue. As Peter said, be ready. One of our brethren at home used to say, his grandpa said, be ready. That way you won't have to get ready. One respondent wrote, every young preacher must learn to give scripture for everything he teaches and practices. He cites Colossians 3.16, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And also 1 Peter 4.11, when he says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Good advice. I would be remiss if I didn't address one other thing. This comes under the category of other Several preachers mentioned the importance of choosing a life partner. One said young men should think carefully about whom they date and marry. They need a wife who will be supportive, but also a wife who will offer them criticism when needed, not just a wife who will rubber stamp everything they do. One said at the top of the list, should be marry the right kind of woman. Another said, who you marry will have a great deal to do with your success as a preacher. And he added, marry a child of the devil and you'll have trouble with your father-in-law. I know how important that is by experience, friends. I was thankful to find a girl who knew what it was to sacrifice. I married one who was always willing to go the extra mile and to live among some who thought you could live on earth and board in heaven. And sometimes in the strain and struggle of preaching, the only one you can talk to, the only one who you can depend on, is a faithful, dedicated wife. Many are those who might have made a good preacher, but made the mistake of marrying some high maintenance girl who was not willing to sacrifice and make the commitment needed in preaching. I could say more, but I go on. I want to mention books. As you know, that's one of my favorite items is books. When I began preaching, I knew I needed books, but I had no idea 
where to begin. And I was thankful to have Brother Irvin Water and Landwood Smith to tell me about what to buy and what would be helpful. You know, I don't know exactly what books Paul meant in 2 Timothy 4.13 when he wrote these words. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus. When thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. I know one thing, it wasn't New Testaments, was it? Because that hadn't been written yet. So it's important to have books that will help you. One of our most venerable gospel preachers mentioned that that was more valuable than a college education because there are some books that are helpful that will give you insight into the scriptures. Several brethren stress the importance of that. Some of the books that would be helpful to young preachers are out of print today. Some of them are on the internet and can be looked up. I want to mention a couple and then if there are others that people recommend, we can mention that in the question period. But one book that is very helpful for a young preacher would be The Preacher and His Work by Jack Meyer Sr. One reason I recommend this book is because it has a list of books that are valuable to the preacher. Another good list of recommendations is in How to Study the Scriptures by Guy and Woods. And I'm sure every preacher has books he would recommend. I want to mention two that have helped me tremendously and I certainly have always recommended to every young preacher and that is McGarvey's Fourfold Gospel and his original commentary on Acts. They're invaluable in my estimation. Now every young preacher needs a book list and one said sink every available dollar into good books from the very start. Good books are more important than a nice house or a nice car. Unquote. Here's a suggestion for you. Let it be known to your friends and to your relatives and to anybody that may be interested in your success as a preacher. What books you need. Make you out a list and that you would appreciate that for a birthday present or some other present when the time comes for you to have a gift. Build your library because you will depend upon that. <coughs> I want to just mention one thing that I thought was striking. Brother J.D. McGarvey, when he left to go to the Holy Land, didn't know whether he would ever return or not, I guess. He was like a lot of us who travel. And he left his friends and went into his library to spend a few moments with his books. That tells you how much he thought of them and how much many of us think of our books. 